Mahatma Gandhi famously observed, it is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold or silver. True enough, as anyone who has lost his or her health would attest, but there's also no disputing that gold and silver, or their more prosaic counterpart, government funding, can make it easier for an individual or an entire community to avoid or recover from illness. Hi, I'm John Schwannis, and on this week's show, we'll do a full workup on Hoosier's biggest health and health care challenges. So hop up here on the table, the discussion table that is, and we'll be right in. Indiana lawmakers, from the state house to your house. And who said nobody makes house calls anymore? Dozens of studies have pointed to a link between health and wealth, often creating groups of haves and have nots, those who have access and those who don't. Among other things, well-to-do individuals often have greater access to nutritious food, safe non-toxic surroundings, and preventive health care, including regular screenings. On the other hand, those who are struggling financially have been known to put off seeking medical care until once manageable conditions turn into costly, full-blown emergencies. Now, economic factors can have an equally profound impact on the well-being of entire populations, and that's where public health comes in. Simply put, public health is the science of protecting and improving the health of a community through the promotion of healthy lifestyles, the prevention of injuries and chronic disorders, and the detection and containment of infectious diseases. Unfortunately, Indiana is one of the unhealthiest states in the nation, as determined by metrics such as obesity, tobacco use, infant mortality, physical inactivity, and life expectancy. It's probably no coincidence that, until recently, Indiana also ranked toward the bottom of all states in per capita spending for public health. For decades, annual state funding hovered around $7 million. Last year, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, Indiana lawmakers heeded Governor Eric Holcomb's call for a renewed commitment to Hoosiers Health, allocating $75 million for local health departments this year and $150 million next year. So far, all but six of Indiana's 92 counties have opted into the so-called Health First Indiana Initiative. The injection of new state funding promises to make Indiana something of a medical testing ground. The question at hand, if money can't buy happiness, can it at least secure better health? With March Madness looming, a lot of Hoosiers are paying extra attention to rankings, but here's one that should make us pretty darn mad and more than a little alarmed all year long. According to a study released fat last fall by Forbes advisor, Indiana is number 10 from the bottom when it comes to accessibility, affordability, quality, and efficacy of health care. And that's bad news indeed for a state that already has, as we just noted, one of the unhealthiest populations in the country. How did we get here? And more important, what can we do to fix the problem? Joining me to discuss the issue are Democratic Senator Shelley Yoder of Bloomington, a member of the Senate's Health and Provider Services Committee, a senior lecturer at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business, and the one-time director of a nonprofit focused on women's health care, and former Republican Senator and former State Representative John Ruckelhaus of Indianapolis, Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Indiana State Medical Association, and previously an executive with a health care benefits company and the head of a nonprofit dedicated to helping individuals who've suffered spinal cord injuries. Thank you both. And I will stipulate uh, to regular viewers and listeners, that's a much longer uh, introduction than typical. But I wanted on an issue like this to point out that you approach this not just as policymakers dealing with dollars and cents and statistics, but as healthcare consumers in a very real sense yourselves and who, people who have been touched dramatically by, by healthcare. So that's, that explains the introductions. All right, we're, we're, we're not very good in any of these rankings uh, right now cost or, or our own health attainment. I mean, I don't know who to blame, though, in, in this quest to keep uh, costs down and accessibility high. So I'm going to ask you both, who should we blame here? Uh, Senator Yoder, we'll start with you. Well, I don't know how much we're going to get accomplished by blaming people, but I think it is important. Oh, but important. It's, makes, it's fun, though. <laughs> but I think it's really important to show the impact that it's having on Hoosiers' lives. Uh, from the $1 billion real error in fiscal oversight, mismanagement, 
to how it's impacting Hoosiers. This is Medicaid this dollars is Medicaid, that uh, just uh, popped up in December. Yes, the Medicaid. How did we miss a billion dollars? When I would say we didn't miss it. We just didn't uh, know about it. Uh, so there's that. And trying to find a way of really getting some solutions for Hoosiers working together to ease that burden of healthcare costs. But you're right, we're also lagging behind when it comes to health outcomes, and we have to get very serious about addressing those. So when we put up the villainous dartboard uh, and start you know, pitching those darts, we don't, you're not gonna tell us whether we should put hospitals up there or physicians up there or insurance companies up there or Hoosiers themselves. I think Hoosiers themselves want answers. They want relief in this area. And what, what we need to identify are good solutions. And I know the, Democrat, uh, the Democratic Senate caucus, we have filed bills that would address this. We've been sort of sounding the alarms of specifically the $1 billion Medicaid, oops, uh, mismanagement of funds, uh, lack of transparency. We've been sort of sounding that alarm and we have not gotten anywhere as, as, as early as this session. So I know that Hoosiers, they want to know, okay, what are we going to do about it? And how we go about doing, uh, addressing it is going to, again, impact Hoosiers directly. So I think it's really important. The how and the why, also important. John Ruckelhaus, you're not in office now. You don't have to be as diplomatic <laughs> and, as, and as politically astute as your, as your pan, fellow panelists here. Um, you represent 9,000 physicians, medical students. I'm guessing they're not the problem in your eyes. Well, I think Senator Schroeder, or <laughs> Senator Yoder, excuse me, did a very good job, and you did a very good job, John, of framing this, because when you look at health care, there's no greater issue in America than health care. It touches every Hoosier, it touches every American, it's 17, almost 18 percent of the gross domestic product, meaning 17 to 18 cents of every dollar is spent in health care. I always look at this that you can't point your finger at one particular individual, it's a circular firing squad, frankly and everybody has skin in the game. Hoosiers have skin in the game by obesity, by smoking, by those issues that are lifestyle changes that we have to address. We've got to get healthier as Hoosiers. That helps drive this. Physicians are coming to the table. We're one of the lowest reimbursed in the, in the United States, and we're trying, obviously, we're trying to get more physicians into the marketplace and into the rural areas as well. So all hands on deck have to be a part of this. And Senator Yoder is exactly right. This is more than a Republican or a Democrat issue. This is a Hoosier issue. Well, and you point out the economic realities of this, too, when people say, oh, the problem is high pharmacy costs. Well, I'm mad at drug makers. I'm mad at the people who develop and, and distribute uh, medical implements. And, well, Indiana has more than a, than a passing uh, stake in, in those industries, certainly. I, if 15 or 17 percent is the national, we probably even have more of our... our uh, domestic product and output here tied up in that. So to your point, that circular firing squad probably is an apt metaphor. So if we were addressing some of the health, less than healthful habits of Hoosiers, and I, I include myself in, in, in that, I'm not pointing fingers. Uh, now the Hospital Association did a study in the past year, said $3 billion we could save, and that's direct cost, but also employer health premiums. I mean, that, that throws a lot of things mm -hmm. in there. Is that, is that really, I mean, could Hoosiers really make that much of an impact just by curbing the smoking, eating better, mm -hmm. trying to deal with their diabetes? We had a lot of discussions about this as we worked very hard on Senate Bill 3 last year in the uh, Public Health Commission that we wanted to engage uh, with the state health department and local health departments partnering together. And yes, it is expensive. Uh, the impact of heart disease, the impact of obesity, the impact of our high smoking rates, our high vaping rates in the state of Indiana, they do have significant health care cost impact. And we can address some of that there. We also have to address the fact that I'm, I'm just very concerned about the priorities here because we could address Medicaid, we could address the difficulty in access when we cannot attract healthcare providers and keep healthcare providers in this state by really having an, a serious conversation about passing a near ban uh, on abortion care in this state. It does nothing but hurt Hoosiers 
on a very unpopular policy and worsen each and every one of these areas that you've brought up. So you're saying that that alone is an issue that is driving up costs because physicians are fleeing the state, that the, the care is not as affordable? Absolutely. It certainly isn't helping. It certainly is not going to help. And I, I have been very vocal about this, that we could address each of these pockets by that one policy that is incredibly unpopular in Indiana and at least show Hoosiers that we are serious about uh, putting aside these um, culture wars and letting Hoosiers decide uh, the kind of care that they need with their physicians. You know, the Health Care Oversight Task Force addressed a lot of issues. That was not one of them, but, uh, and, uh, but you certainly uh, bring that to the table and it's, it's worth, worthy of uh, discussion as well. You know, it's, it, it's not for lack of legislation that these issues are, are out here. I, I think about two years ago, I think about last year, there had been uh, a commission that had looked at this, uh, worked quite hard, collected a lot of input. We had a, yet another task force that uh, met during the, uh, the interim prior to this session. But things just sort of, uh, you know, there were caps proposed. There were stringent uh, bans on no compete provisions for physicians so they could maybe leave their current employers if they, if they so chose. And, without having to move out of the state. All kinds of, but everything sort of at the end got watered down. Why, does, why did we have so much trouble as a state, do you think, John Ruckelhaus, getting these bills across the line? Well, you're talking about a lot of stakeholders that are at the table, and you have some big entities. And I think we have to pull back and look, again, where we are at healthcare in America and in Indiana. It's consolidating. So you have fewer hospitals providing more services. Fewer amount of physicians, nurses, et cetera. There's a nursing shortage. We have a shortage of everything in the worker capacity. The only thing we don't have a shortage is people running for office. So the point is, is that there is a severe shortage around. So what happens is when you have these big players to try to come to the table, nobody wants to give. So that's what we've been trying to work on. I think the governor did a really good job last year, former Senator Luke Kindley. Uh, spearheaded that in Senate Bill 4 and came through the Senate, as a matter of fact. And that is a good first step uh, because that brings the health care down to the granular level. It brings it down to the county level where it needs to be a one-on-one. -on -one. If we're going to change Hoosiers, one of the things we didn't talk about, and Senator Yoder, I think you were kind of alluding to this or trying to get there, is we need to take a look at the cigarette tax increase. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an initiative that is bipartisan. It passed the House multiple times. It stalled in the Senate. When I was there, we actually raised the tobacco age. But if you want to move the needle, that's the one quick policy piece that you could do. Let me give you a real world Some of the example. most zealous supporters actually have been Republican stalwarts like the chamber and, and uh, other entities that normally don't align with uh, uh, with. They don't, they don't depart from the, the party lines. So that's exactly right. So I think probably not this session, but I think next session, that clearly is going to be on the table. Yeah. Because what we could do with this $1 billion surprise mistake uh, that points to so many things, you know, $1 billion Medicaid error, I think we could say instead of first starting with sort of pulling the rug out from underneath so many Hoosier families who are caring for the most medically complex children, these families who have come to rely on being able to be paid for caring for their child. Now, some people might say, uh, well, what, why should you get paid for caring for your child? I would push back and say, if it was your child and you want the best quality care, Indiana should be able to pay parents to be able to not live in poverty, to be able to stay home and care for their medically complex child, and be reimbursed for that. Considering all of the short, uh, shortcomings that we have, the lack of health care and a lack of health providers that we have in the state of Indiana, uh, in order to address some of these issues of outcomes and this $1 billion Medicaid shortfall, I think it's a real mistake to start that uh, fiscal fine-tuning or, or fixing the mistake on the backs of some of our Hoosiers most medically complex. Well, you know, it, let's dive into a few of these issues because you both have now brought several up. And, and let me go back, uh, if I may, just briefly to the notion of unhealthy Hoosiers because both of you talk, talked about Luke Kinley, the, the group, and there were others, Susan Brooks and others. I don't want to leave anybody off that deserves credit for that. But look, suggested, you know, half a billion dollars should be 
thrown at, not thrown, invested in uh, public health. Uh, it's been uh, lagging for years. I think we'd averaged as a state about $7 million a year. We ended up about uh, 75 million first year, the biennium 150 second year, so about half of the, the request. And I think uh, most of the Indiana counties have signed up. There's a local match required, which is why I presume it's not 92, all 92. But can we hope that that is going to have an impact, or is that, uh, uh, I mean, will that move the needle in any significant way? I think it was a huge wake up call. When you say no, 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 no to public health investment for almost two decades, and then realize the mistake that that was because of how far behind Indiana has fallen and that we've lost a life expectancy for your male working age individual in the state of Indiana the first time ever. We've started to not track with the life expectancy of the United States but are starting to go down. Yes, it is a wake up call and an, an irresponsible approach to public health. So my hope is every county will invest uh, in partnering. And the great thing that local communities can do, local health departments and uh, county commissioner, the executors of the, of the counties, they can decide what are the biggest uh, outcomes that we need to see improvements and partner and really fine tune how, that do how those dollars are going to be spent. That was the best thing I think that we did last year is to really enable a partnership and a communication bridge from at the local level to getting those dollars from the state to address unique needs and in it, every county. And it may mean that the six counties that didn't sign up at this to this point have the opportunity. I mean, they do have the opportunity. Always. Whether they take the opportunity is another question. John Ruckelhouse, let's let's say everything. This plan, the investment uh, in public health, pays huge dividends. Everybody starts training for marathons. Everybody quits cold turkey, we're going to get healthy. Still doesn't address the issues of the cost and accessibility of, of hospital care and physician availability and so forth. What's the one thing we can do as a state, aside from getting healthier, that would help address that issue? Well, just to circle back and finish up here, keep in mind with the governor's health care initiative that we had last year that was so important about that, 50% over nine, of the 92 counties, <clears throat> excuse me, that we do have, half of the counties have a population of less than 50,000. So they didn't have the tax base to do this. So that's extremely important there. So yes, rural hospitals have closed at an alarming rate. Um, count, lots of counties. <clears throat> I don't know what this number is now that don't have any count, uh, hospitals. At Correct. All. So one of the things that we've been advocating for is graduate medical education. So Indiana has, Indiana University has the largest medical school in the country. So one of the things that we know, if graduates of Indiana University, they do their fellowship and they do their residency trainings, 70% of them stay in the area that they do it. The state could clearly look at subsidization and debt, student debt. Uh, medical students graduate with over $250,000 on average debt. The state could help subsidize if the commitment is to stay in the rural areas and participate in take care of Hoosiers. And with IU being the largest medical school now yeah. by enrollment in the country, right, if not the world, I guess that could have an impact. And that's Senator. true. I, I would agree with uh, John on that point. However, those numbers and that percentage was pre the abortion ban in the state of Indiana. And we know that medical students who are graduating are looking closely at where their own licensing and profession is going to be at risk. And those states that have put politicians inside of the examination room, those are the states that they are saying, I don't want to practice there. I'm going to invest in my professional career and in my calling and my vocation in a state that doesn't put myself and my family at risk. So I, I go back to, we could address this by repealing the abortion ban that we put in place in the state of Indiana. Again, an important issue. I'm guessing uh, not one that typically shows up in discussions about healthcare cost containment, but but again, a very good, legitimate point you bring up. Um, it it does show up, it is showing up, and there is a reason why this topic gets excluded. It's because we don't want to talk about it. You know, we had a a bill that it was a good bill. It was addressing prior authorization, and it was a priority of. The you read Republican my mind. Party. I was going to ask you, since that's one yes. bill that's, that was a, a, a Republican right. priority in the it Senate was until it wasn't. A, a, and then it disappeared. 
And in the committee hearing that we had on this bill, I asked uh, the, the author of the bill, who does get to be in that room deciding the care that you get? And the author of the bill said, no one, not insurance. They don't get to dictate the care that's needed for a physician to address the needs of a, of a patient. And I said, then why put politicians there, which is what we did with passing that abortion care. And then Senate Bill 3, which was what the prior authorization bill was, disappeared. Authored by a physician, I believe. Correct, uh, Senator Tyler Johnson. Right. So now, uh, again, we can debate why it disappeared, as you put it, and I think clearly we, the fiscal impact was uh, lurking, uh, looming large here. Right. How much of a significant impact do you think that could have? Uh, I mean, pre-authorization is a way of life uh, for the insurance industry, certainly for our state. Is that, is that the silver bullet? Oh, point? this is a major, major issue, and it's all about patient safety and livelihood, because what we found out is that this is a notion and this has been a tool that's been used by insurance companies probably 40, 50 years to quote unquote contain healthcare costs. And as a former employer, I understand that, paying the premiums for employees. As a former, as an employee, I understand that too, because we want to keep healthcare costs down, but it's run amok. Now with all the sophistication and algorithms and everything else, over 90% we're finding out claims are being denied on the front end, and then over 93% of them are being approved. So there's a lot of shell game, patient delays, and people are up in arms. And this is what our physicians are telling us, this is what Hoosiers are telling senators and representatives. There were three bills that were introduced in the House this year on this issue, about two bills in the Senate that were introduced. It will be back in some form oh, I think that's prior a, that's authorization a, that's before the session's over. Because it was, uh, it was offered last year, didn't right. prevail, and, well, let and me again say this. this year. I'm going to actually push back a little bit, John, on the, the notion that Senate Bill, this prior authorization bill, disappeared because of the fiscal. We already knew, the supermajority knew that they were not opening this budget. This was the, the last day that we could hear from Republicans on what their priorities are going to be. Session had already started. They absolutely knew about their priorities. You cannot tell me that the fiscal note on this, which came back, it didn't show a price tag, that all of a sudden it was another surprise. We get a billion dollar mistake that is costing, that's going to cost Hoosiers significantly uh, in December. And then we're gonna have another surprise fiscally. So I just wanna push back a little bit and say that this was a, it was a, it, that bill disappeared because of the fiscal impact because they absolutely knew I think it's because they realized that they had stepped in it. And if you want to talk about trying to control... No doubt it's a controversial bill. I mean, but, I think, but I mean, there I think is a huge impact, year, even from the Medicaid standpoint, which is a, also deals with pre-authorization. Before we run out of time, yeah. uh, and I know you're passionate about this, so I, I hate to move on, but we've got a lot of territory to cover in a short amount of time. So uh, we've, we've addressed Hoosiers who are not very healthy. We've We've talked about insurance companies. Are they the, the bad guys? Hospitals. Some economists say it is that lack of competition. Uh, we have several major hospital groups, you know, and in the past they have had non-competes. They can't do it for primary care physicians now, but right. they can still have non-competes right. for everybody right. else. Um, how do you, John Rockelhouse, uh, make sure that hospitals are in line with, with reasonable costs without putting more of them out of business? Because a lot of them are, I mean, they run in the red a lot. I mean, it's, it's, right. it's not a one-size-fits-all. Yeah, there are huge surpluses for some, but not for all. Right. We still need strong hospitals. We still need strong fiscal hospitals, financially responsible. No question about it. We need that. But one of the things that we've been working on for physicians is more of an independent practice. If you look at House Bill 1004 from last year, for the first time, the Indiana General Assembly gave a $20,000 tax credit for physicians that would go out on their own and have independent practice. So I think if we could decouple physicians and they have more independent practice so that they can actually consumers and their patients are true consumers of they healthcare. could offer testing in their Correct. labs and so forth that maybe would compete with, especially if the non-compete goes away as Correct. it is for, not for, for primary care. Correct, so more independent physician practices long-term, I think will go a long way. And you way. wanna see, I presume the primary care Ban be extended. Correct. Uh, I mean, the, the ban, the non compete extended. Correct. I just Final word. Add, uh, yeah. I would say part of the physicians are the nurses. 
I mean, if you're ever going to talk about how this impacts healthcare, is the burnout and the uh, high turnover in the nursing uh, profession. And I am meeting more retired nurses than I'm meeting nurses who are actually providing the care, probably because they're working so hard day in and day out providing care for Hoosiers. And we need to address what they're asking for, and that is you know, some workplace uh, balance uh, being uh, respected in their profession and making sure that we are doing everything that we can to address that high turnover and burnout that nurses are there's an outcry on what they're facing today. All right. I'll tell you, we got to leave it there, but we covered a lot of territory. And in fact, in deference to this healthy Hoosier kick, I feel like I got to work out just trying to keep up with, with you two uh, uh, today. But thank you for your insights. Meet you and, in the gym. And your, uh, your passion <laughs> on, these, uh, on this very critically important subject that really does affect all of us. Again, my guests have been Democratic Senator Shelley Yoder of Bloomington and former Republican Senator John Ruckelhaus of Indianapolis, now Vice President of gov governmental affairs for the Indiana State Medical Association. Indiana has a love-hate relationship with technology. We love it when it simplifies our lives, but not so much when it displaces workers or empowers criminals. On the next Indiana Lawmakers. And time now for our weekly conversation with Indiana Lawmakers commentator Ed Feigenbaum, publisher of the newsletter Indiana Legislative Insight, part of Hanna News Service. Ed, hard to believe we're at the halfway point. Hill Sin, surprises? I think the biggest surprise is that we've got five members of the legislature running for Congress. I don't think anybody expected that at the beginning of the year with all the congressional resignations and people wanting to, to move on up the food chain. But we also, have, I think, have seen some surprises with legislation. I don't know that anybody would have predicted that a wetlands bill would have been the first one through both chambers and, and on its way to the governor. But when you look at, at the health care things that we were talking about earlier in, in the, the round table, that prior authorization bill in particular, I think that was the one big surprise this year, that that hasn't gone further, that that didn't go through the Senate in the first half of the session. Because um, usually but, when a bill has a single digit attached to it, it is a leadership bill, and, and, it and was, that's going to be on rails. Certainly, and it was a Senate Majority Caucus uh, agenda item as a priority. And I think, you know, yes, the, the cost was, was a little bit uh, more than they thought it would be. And there were some questions about whether it might even be higher. I think you'll still see something along those lines. I think um, John Ruckelhaus alluded to that with, with uh, some more attention to this at the end of the session. I think what you'll see is, is more reporting. Uh, insurance companies required to report when and why they turn things down. That may lead to something next session like you've got in, in Texas with that gold card where good providers, providers who have shown a, a record of, of doing things well, will be able to do things without prior authorization going forward. But that's still you know, another session away, and then it would take a long time to, to implement a program like that administratively. So essentially everything that's cost containment measure we've seen this year and last year will be back in some way, shape, or form. Oh, no doubt, and it'll be a budget session, so they won't have an excuse not to do it. All right. Very good, Ed. As always, appreciate your insight. Thank you, John. Well, that concludes another edition of Indiana Lawmakers. I'm John Schwannis, and on behalf of commentator Ed Feigenbaum, WFYI Public Media, and Indiana's other public broadcasting stations, I thank you for joining us, and I invite you to visit WFYI.org for more Statehouse news. Until next week, take care.